Okay. Thank you, Bill. Uh, welcome to this session, which is uh, titled Shifting Financial and Technological Literacies. Looks like a very interesting session. Three great papers. Uh, the first paper is by Roxana Beretta Casserell and Judith Marisa. I hope I got the names right. The title is Banking the Poor Through Mobile Telephone in Latin America. The context is Latin America. Thank you. Good morning. Bill is saying something, I don't understand. It's okay, you can hear me well. Good morning, everybody, <laughs> thank you. Oh. Okay, here. Um, thank you to I am um, TFI for, for the invitation and the support of this investigation. I am doing this in collaboration with my colleague, Roxana Barrantes, who was not able to come today. She did um, part of the initial research, and I'm doing a second, but let me go. We're looking at the, a case of Latin America. Oops. Right. Um, so I'm gonna talk about the context. This is mostly, a regulatory perspective of the cases in, in Latin America. As we both are world works and as an economist, I'm a public policy scholar. Um, so we're gonna look at both these sectors, the regulatory environments in the telecommunication sector and in the uh, financial sector as enabling conditions for mobile banking. And there we're gonna go into a case study in Mexico. So this is the part that Roxana Barrantes has been working on, and the, what their, she and her team are doing is applying the telecommunications regulatory environment methodology, which is pretty standard, but applying it to the mobile banking ecosystem. In how it works generally is through surveys, that they do interviews to experts on each of these areas of the um, regulatory system, and they transmit the, the um, what they believe are the scale of these conditions. So there are three basic legs to this methodology. Um, the institutional method, um, environment that looks as a, at the regulation of the financial system existing in each country, looks as in terms of the issues of safety and security, the promotion of financial inclusion practices, protection, and the regulatory environment for telecommunications also. In terms of the market, um, they look at the degree of competition in both sectors, the degree of innovation um, in telecommunications in markets, and in general look at the deployment of infrastructure. What is the access of mobile telephony in general? Um, this also includes terms of affordability as a result of the efficiency of the market or not. Um, they, then the end user perspective looks at, at the availability of these different services and products. Um, the, the assumption here is and that is a demand that can be seen from the lack of financial services, the, the lack of um, financial institution, um, financial inclusion, I'm sorry. One thing that is, I mean, it doesn't go into details and perhaps that is something we should work on and I'm gonna look at the following research for example, is the need for, in the mobile banking ecosystem, the need to have different kinds of partnerships. The partnership between agents, merchants, banks, etc. The other part of the research is looking at a specific case study in Mexico. This is a success 
up to now success story in a very short period of time that is was done in Santiago uh, Nayu in Mexico in the state of Oaxaca. And what we're looking at is what were the conditions that enabled the emergences of this mobile banking model. It, it's a private model that was um, em that emerged out of government coordination in a marginalized community. And this is very early. It's been implemented since last year, so we have some early insights. So looking at these countries, Peru, Guatemala, Paraguay, El Salvador, and I'm putting in Mexico in there just so we could have a comparison, is in general that you have a you know, pretty um, strong access to mobile services in general in all of these countries. Of course, there is more of uh, access in the urban areas and in the rural areas, but why here stands out as almost, and this is really not comparable. I mean, we do have mobile access, and by 2012, we have certainly exceeded these rates. Um, what we don't have there is good data. So they're, they're not, re oops, I'm sorry. It was, <laughs> this, this is it. Um, but it does give us a view of what um, mobile access is in general. So what you know, we can say is that even in the low income segments of the population, people have access to mobiles. Um, there is still an issue of affordability, especially for low income segments of the population. What we see here is the cost of prepaid service, which is the service that most of the poor use, um, well, it's looking at the third decile, um, and what much, what a percentage of their income does telecommunication service, well, mobile service include. You know, Peru is the most expensive in terms of Latin America. This is generally the case. Um, Brazil is not included. If it were, it would beat <laughs> Peru. You know, Brazil right now is one of the most um, expensive mobile services in Latin America, followed closely by Peru and Mexico. And well, the reason as, as to why that is is a whole different um, study, but we do know that uh, you know, Peru and Mexico have very concentrated markets, not as much as, as Brazil. So this is sort of the context of the telecommunication sector. In terms of the financial sector, it's not surprising to see that there is very little access. Peru has the highest level of access, but this is mm, commercial banks. Um, when you go, and you're looking at it um, in terms of penetration, and <clears throat> then in terms of the geographic penetration, when you look at it in terms of ATM, it kind of shuffles around, and El Salvador, comes out with the highest penetration. Still, however, um, we have a very low level of financial inclusion in all of these countries. So the results, what we see here in terms of the scores on the regulatory environment, <clears throat> where they were asking one is very effective, uh, one is very ineffective, and five is very effective, you see the kinds of um, financial regulation of mobile financial services. Uh, then you see regulation only for financial inclusion, then for mobile financial inclusion, um, and coordination and consumer protection in general. So um, sort of nobody is really winning here. They're under a passing grade. Um, you see the case, well, in, in general, Peru has a, shows better, a better score, but not that much more than, than the rest of, of the countries, perhaps. <clears throat> and then one, one of the lowest um, appears to be Salvador in, in most cases. But the next one, yes, I think we're missing the title. But um, the next one looks at the overall scores, and as you see, bottom line is 
the necessary environment for emerging banking model, um, mobile banking models are not met in neither of these countries. They're all pretty much underscored. In most of the cases, reaching the market environment is easier. Um, I'm sorry, the institutional environment is easier, but however, in none of these countries do we see the basic conditions. And that, that is the work in progress. They're still um, doing the interviews, and um, we're still gathering, trying to refine the, the different questions asked to try to have a more complete um, in, uh, picture of the environment in general. At the same time, in Mexico, this Santiago Nuyo uh, community has, came up as an interesting example to study. Um, this, this is a very, very small community, very small town in the mountains of Oaxaca, uh, where most of the population is indigenous. What happened here is that the um, public agency, the telegraph, telecom agency, decided that it was going to implement pilot model here in Oaxaca. Uh, Santiago Nuyo is not connected at all. It doesn't have financial, it didn't have financial services or any kind of voice services. Either. Well, it, it had telephone booth, but basically there was no very low um, fixed phone services and there were zero uh, mobile services. What the results show is this began, this was first implemented in January of last year, of this year, I'm sorry, we're still in this year, and, um, well, not surprisingly, people were given uh, mobile phones, and um, from zero, they, they went up to 100, there was a process of learning, and there has been pretty much a stabilization of 100 calls and 100 SMS monthly per person. What um, the savings went up to eleven point five dollars per month, um, which appears to be a, a pretty large amount in terms of their income, and the accounts um, were up to three hundred and sixteen new accounts by June. There was also payments, monthly payments of an average of 1.5 per person. And when you look at this in terms of transactions, um, the results show that, um, well, there's transactional users, but there's a lot of cash-in of um, savers in the community from January. Then August, there tends to be, well, July especially, and June, that, were, that is the month of the end of the school year, that may be associated to the uh, end of the year of the graduation and, and for children. Overall, though, you can say that in an eight-month period, this has been pretty much a success. Uh, again, you know, we go back to what the success means and what kind of indicators are we trying to look at to, to identify it as a success. Um, and this is very early. You know, we need to go on. Um, we're going to go back to the site and see what's been going on. Uh, so what, was, what happened? Why did a private business model search in this very small community? First of all, in Mexico, and this is not only the case for, for Oaxaca, last year in Mexico, the regulatory financial regulations were designed to promote mobile banking for the poor in general. So what we saw is that the Commission Comisión Nacional Bancaria, the 
the Banking Commission in Mexico created an, a set of rules that facilitated the opening of banking accounts and the, created the existence of the figure of branchless banking. There was the availability of interoperability between banking platforms and a factor, institutional factor, that was obviously key here that would have not have happened was the coordination by Telecom Telegrafos, a, a government um, uh, agency that came here and basically brought everyone together for this to happen. It integrated the suppliers of equipment. It also got some donations by Huawei, the Chinese equipment provider. Um, the banking services, however, were um, based on a profit um, model. Banorte came in. In terms of the market environment, well, that, that's part of, of the conditions that were also studied in the TRE methodology that you needed to have um, inter interoperability, non-discriminatory, cheap and fast transactions between banks, and a coordination of public agencies to try to pay wages and different payments to beneficiaries' accounts directly. In terms of the <clears throat> end user environment, the mandatory free of charge account, the branchless banking, we have almost 17,000 points now in the country, the diminishing requirements to open an account, and a certain degree of competition in banking services in rural areas. At, the, at this point in 2012, we have three different small uh, mobile banking services for the poor com competing in the market. So what are the tentative um, insights, the preliminary insights here? First of all, that yes, you know, we, I, we believe we're in the right direction in terms of trying to identify the basic conditions of the, adapting the TRE methodology to the mobile banking ecosystem. However, I think it needs some details, and what we found out, the results show that these countries, these four countries in Latin America, do not meet even the most basic conditions for mobile banking models to, um, to be opened up. We saw that what happened in Oaxaca was that, while something was going on, on at the federal level that had nothing to do with the telecom agency, that there was a public policy designed to promote mobile banking services to the poor, what happened in Oaxaca was specifically coordinated and integrated by an agency. Thus, the business interests were aligned with the social goals. On the demand side, the, their barriers to entry had diminished. And what was very interesting also to see is that the, this came along, Telecom, Telegrafos Telecom, provided the, the connectivity that was not there through satellite connections, but it also promoted a very specific financial education course for the people that were giving the mobiles and oh, the ones that opened up an account. So it was exactly you know a textbook of what would you have to do. They went to this small town and they did exactly what they were supposed to do. So it's not surprising that we get some positive results. Um, however, in terms of so what, um, the question is, um, we still don't see, even though the basic conditions are there in most of Mexico City, we don't see any real um, significant mo model of um, mobile banking services to the bottom of the pyramid. There has been not a fast adoption. So regulatory factors are certainly necessary conditions, but 
perhaps are not sufficient conditions. Um, is there a role of the state as a driver? Is, would the government be able to go around putting these pilots all over the country? Um, certainly, we do know that operators have yet to successfully replicate other models as, as, as in Kenya, the Empesa, which at some level we believe maybe is a fluke, yeah, but you know, that's open to question. Uh, so even when the basic environment exists, as in Mexico, we do not see a model going on, operators going on, carriers going on, on their own to really replicate these kind of models. Um, rapidly and in a large scale. Okay, thank you. We'll wait for the next two presentations and then open the session for questions. Uh, next uh, presenter, the title is uh, Farmers Access to ICT Based software in household savings generation in the Philippines. The speaker is Ellerin Isles. Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, in the last four years, I was witness to Micro Philippines market research and trainings on mobile banking and agriculture finance through the support of Micro Philippines major donor Mercy Corps. Back then, I was like this child, excited to see what's on the other side of what seemed to be the field of dreams. Mobile banking is like the red flower in the photo that is so attractive, eye-catching, that you would want to hold close to you. In December 7 to 9, 2011, just a year ago, I attended the ICT workshop for agriculture at the International Rice Research Institute. Apart from the friendships developed during the workshop, I took home with me this vision of optimizing the productivity of farmers through ICT. Instantly, I knew then I have a proposal to draft when I reach home. IMTFI has been in my radar since I facilitated submission of Micro Philippines proposal in 2010 where Micro first the, when Micro first got the research grant. Great things snowballed since IMTFI confirmed another research grant, um, which is the impact of farmers' access to ICT services on household savings and credit payment, which I'm presenting now. In September 2011, I also took a course on optimizing farmers' productivity in the Netherlands, where another group is awaiting for the result of this research, and this is just the beginning. This, research, this impact research of farmers' access to ICT services on household savings and credit payments aims to understand how mobile ICT applications changes farmer access. Two, understand key elements of farmer adop adoptions. And three, understand MFI's capability of pursuing new farmer segments, capture greater farmer data, and promote cross-selling through ICT-based agriculture technology support and ultimately mobile money. Two of existing microfinance institution clients of Micro Philippines that implements micro agri-loan program were included in the research with a delay in the implementation of um, micro agri-loan program by the Department of Agrarian Reform. These two MFIs are from the Visayas and Mindanao in Philippines. Cebu City is the, in the Visayas while Sarangani is in Mindanao. Cebu City is the second most significant metropolitan center in the Philippines and the main domestic shipping port with 80% of, uh, of the country's domestic shipping companies. Sarangani, on the other hand, belongs to the top 10 poorest provinces with tuna as a main product. From these two MFIs, profiling of its clients in Sarangani and Cebu, were made, specifically with first consolidated along Tanon Seaboard in Cebu City and Malapatan Multipurpose Cooperative in Sarangani were conducted. Profiling of agricultural ICT-based services in the Philippines came as a surprise as there are not just one nor two of these kinds. 
This study looks into four agriculture ICT-based services, including the Nutrient Manager, Crop Manager, E-Extension E-Learning by the Agriculture Training Institute, and the Agriculture and Fisheries Market, Market Information System. NMRISE was launched in January 2011 by IRI through its Agriculture Application Laboratory in Los Banos, Laguna, Philippines. NMRISE is a web and mobile phone application that provides guidelines to farmers on fertilizer application to specific field or rice growing area using internet accessible um, through computer or smartphones. IVRS are available through GLOBE toll-free number 2378, while um, Crop Manager is a tool that tests and validates Okay, um, the Crop Manager is a tool that tests and validates um, management options to help farmers copy with problems relating to flooding, drought, or even salinity. The crop doctor is a field diagnostic for identifying factors limited to rice crop growth brought by insects, pests, ro rodents, nematodes, diseases, and weeds. And this will all be available by early 2014. Another agriculture IT service is the e-extension e-learning by the Agrarian Training Institute that provides on online agriculture trainings. This e-learning has uh, resources on agriculture, marine and fisheries, livestock and poultry, crops, sustainable agriculture, e-extension offices, and other digital resources. Their latest addition to the online modules is writing winning proposals. One highly interesting agriculture ICT service is the Agriculture and Fisheries Market Information System, that captures supply, demand, and pricing for agriculture-related products. In line with the research methodology, a total of 223 farmer respondents were randomly selected by MFIs with 111 for MMPC and 112 for FCCT. The work plan for this study was adjusted um, to July as pre-field pre activities were completed. This includes tools development and confirmation of participating microfinance institutions. The next phase of the project was completed in August and November. This involved field data gathering, encoding, analysis, and further processing. Pre preliminary report was also prepared in November with this presentation forming part of the mid-research report. Moving forward, further data gathering and processing are expected in January towards submission of final report in March 2013. Some of the initial findings include farmer savings and credit payment, or along the lines of farmer savings and credit payment, relation between the access of ICT services and farmer savings and credit payment level, Comparative analysis for Serangani and Cebu, and the perception of farmer households on ICT services. Okay. Farmer household spending pattern or priorities were looked upon to see the top three priorities of the respondents. Small business and medical um, expenses ranked first, while savings came in second, while um, payment for tuition fee as the third. Though only 49% of the respondents consider the importance of saving for business and medicine. We see the potential for developing several products that would cater to the needs of these MFIs, rather MFI clients. The least three priorities are socials, gadgets, and furniture. What used to be a priority for rural areas, um, that's social function, are no longer given as much priority now. Gadgets are also seen as not a priority expense together with the house furniture. From the profiling of clients, we see that the farmer saving method are mostly at home, 15% and on business, 12%. We also had to check if farmers are really able to save, with only 24% expressing that they have no savings. 
Next, we look at the farmer's loan history. Um, here's a graph on formal and informal loan availment of the respondents. With FCCT, FCCT there is nearly 90% of the respondents with formal loans and slightly higher than 10% without formal loans. We know that from 0.0 to 10% becomes FCCT's potential clients, with those from 0% to near 90% as clients for cross-selling. MMPC has a low number of clients with formal loans at close to 25%. MMPC clearly has the bigger market potential from 0% to nearly 75%. From this presentation, we can see that FCCT is doing well in competing with the informal loan providers. MMPC, on the other hand, needs to strategize on how it can see the, exceed the provision of informal loans in the area. Then we look at the relation between the access to ICT services and the farmer savings and credit payment level. In the areas of farm production, farm, produ farm production quality, farm improvement, and demand for technical assistance. Initial market survey shows that 80% of the respondents inherited their far farmland with nearly 45% buying their farmlands. Most of the farmers in Cebu own, uh, and that's above uh, 70%, while those in Sarangani, nearly 60% owning their land as well. In terms of production quality, 50% of FCCT survey respondents hire farm helpers, while MMPC is at 30%. For both areas, corn is the preferred crop. It is worth looking at the next phase of the research on the second choice for crop as corn is even considered to be the lazy farmer's crop. Once it is planted, farmers can just wait for the harvest season because corn is the least maintenance crop in the area. The second choice crop can actually provide a good income stream to farmers that will help them generate savings to pay and even pay for credit if properly selected. Farm improvements are deemed to be important by nearly 100, per, 100 respondents with 60 from FCCT and 40 from MMPC. MMPC likewise has 40 respondents not looking at farm improvements as important. Next phase of the study can look into the agriculture services availed by the, within the area that can somehow create a greater impact on farmer perception on the farm improvement. FCCT registered a high demand for farm technical assistance with MMPC close by. Few respondents considered that there is no demand for, farmer, for farm technical assistance. We initially looked upon Sarangani and Cebu respondents' saving and credit repayment patterns, farmer household production, and improvement priorities. The demand for technical assistance, climate change co coping mechanism, will be discussed great in greater detail in the final report. Farmer entrepreneurship is not yet embraced by all the respondents as farmers are regarded not as self-employed or, or not even an entrepreneur. This is just one of the areas for possible capacity building for this MFIs. When asked um, respondents' perception of cash deposit and loan repayments through mobile phone, 57% expressed um, openness to it, with majority from MMPC highly favorable to this scheme. Um, in conclusion, farmers need human intermediaries to facilitate the learning process and actual use of ICT services. Um, access to ICT services, household savings, and repayment capacity are also not correlated to the richness or poorness of the area. The relation between access to ICT services and the repayment capacity is much more complicated that need to be thoroughly investigated. ICT services can also be utilized for capacity building of MFIs whose impact will trickle down um, to the farmers. There's also a greater need to develop farmer entrepreneurship through ICT services. Um, farmers definitely prefer first-hand experiences on the agriculture technolo technologies. And um, it, it was also found out that 
um, farmers still look for information through the TV, um, radio, and even printed materials. Farmers are also not well informed on the seminars offered by the government and private sector, um, where um, earlier we mentioned all those available agricultural um, technical services. Um, they need to uh, add up more on the promotion of these seminars. And farmers also consider ICT innovation only as an optional tool. Farmers also um, prefer person-to-person -person interaction, making MFI's account officers as the viable link to developing farmers' agricultural knowledge and ICT adoption, influencing the next and definitely influencing the next generation farmers of the youth in uh, every farmer household. Some of the service upgrade um, that we see towards um, 2013 for these MFIs include um, additional workshops on nutrient and crop manager in Sarangani and Cebu. And then there will also be um, additional funding support that MMPC would be getting through some linkages assistance. Um, FCCT will be also conducting a business development service for their um, micro agri loan clients. And um, there has also been some uh, proposals on youth farmer entrepreneurship program that is being reviewed um, by a local company for, the C for their CSR program. Uh, another thing, uh, the, no the Royal Netherlands Embassy has been considering bringing the farmer productivity course to the Philippines in 2013. I hope you're all able to learn something from this Mead Project report as much as I did. I would like to thank Dr. Bill, Jenny, and the entire team for making this conference a success. Malapatan Multipurpose Cooperative and First Consolidated Cooperative along Tanyon Seabirds that extended their full support in making this research happen. Mercy Corps for the extensive research done through Micro Philippines in understanding the Philippine mobile banking from 2009 to 2011, and Dr. Sheikh of the International Rice Research Institute to help me in putting together this presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, two excellent papers from different parts of the globe. One, Latin America Comparative Study. One from Philippines. I think this is an excellent session. I think the next uh, paper is also going to be very exciting and interesting. And the context is Brazil. Thank you. So, good morning, everybody. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the uh, I am the FI uh, team, Jenny and Bill, especially, for helping us, uh, supporting us on, on, on this research. Uh, I must tell you that uh, it's my second time here. I came here last year, but uh, the team from uh, the, the center, research center of, uh, for microfinance studies, but I, I'm part of, it's the fourth time that, they, that we came here to, to this conference. Okay, so let's go. Well, Okay, so first of all, a little bit about uh, Brazil that you know that you're gonna organize the World Cup very soon, yeah? <laughs> but there's probably other things that you don't know. <laughs> so uh, we are almost 200 million people, but already 206 million uh, cell phones uh, all over the country. 82% of them uh, are prepaid. But on the other hand, so we have uh, only 45% of adults that have bank accounts. If you count uh, them among the poor people, so two thirds of the, the, the poor people, don't, uh, adult poor people don't have uh, bank accounts. Even they, they have, you know, they support their families, they, they make, they have some income, but they don't have access to bank accounts. Uh, another thing that's comparing uh, the mobile uh, with the bank systems, so, so the, the, the mobile is 100% coverage all over the country while uh, in the, in the bank system covers more the richer part of the country, which is the south, the north and northeast part of the country where are the poorest, uh, most of the poor live. Uh, so they, they are not covered uh, mostly by, by, by banks. All of this altogether makes that the 70% the, the, the of all transactions in Brazil are done through cash. So then, uh, 
even we, we, we have a, a, a very a cash society there in Brazil, so and uh, like to explain a bit that we work the way it is. So and then we we we, we uh, want to focus our study in the northeast of the country. That's because I think it's the most interesting things are going on are in the north and the northeast of the country. So we're going to uh, tell you a little bit about uh, the, the city of Fortaleza, which is in the state of Ceará in the northeast of the country. We're going to talk a little bit uh, in particular about uh, the, the Instituto Palmas, which is uh, uh, MFI that is located in the south part, the poorest part of the city of Fortaleza, uh, which is the capital of the state of Ceará. Here you can see a, a little bit about what, what uh, this MFI, it's not only an MFI actually, it's, it's also a, a, a neighborhood association. So I must tell you that uh, this neighborhood is, uh, there's about 30,000 people that live around this, this neighborhood. In uh, this MFI, Instituto Palmas, they created the Banco Palmas institution that is uh, the, the MFI itself, and, and then they do a lot of things. So you see on the top, they are training people to, 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 to do uh, uh, their own clothes, so they, uh, they do a financial training, like this is a, a session of financial education. There you see uh, uh, people applying for for credit, and you, in the top you see a banner uh, saying that, uh, uh, telling the people to buy inside the neighborhood. So that's the strong uh, uh, campaign that they do there to convince people that it's, if you spend your cash inside the community, so the money you're going to stay in the community, so you're going to create more jobs uh, inside the community. So they are very uh, straightforward on, on, on doing this campaign. Uh, to, to help them on that, so they also create what they call the social currency that uh, is uh, valid only uh, inside the community. So this uh, it's called Palmas, because uh, the, the, the neighborhood is called uh, uh, Conjunto Palmeira. They, they uh, uh, issue this, uh, this uh, currency, uh, and uh, this, this currency is spent only in the community. So through this, this currency, they teach uh, the people how important it is to, to create the, 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 the consumption of things produced inside the community. So they create the whole idea and they, the currency is a strong uh, uh, instrument for helping them to, to do that. Uh, another thing that uh, Banco Palmas, it's not an isolated thing. So it, they, are, they are also the leaders of a, a, a group of community banks all over the country. So there are more than 50 now, so you, you can see in the map that 28 of them are in the state of Ceará. So they are spreading from, they started from in Fortaleza, Banco Palmas is the first one with this model. They start spreading out all over the country, so there are now more than 50 uh, community banks uh, following more or less uh, the, the same uh, style. And for, of course, for all of those banks, they also have different currencies. Each one of those banks has their own currency there. They uh, uh, insist in the same idea to convince people to use, uh, uh, to make the consumption inside the community. So that's why when we heard, we first heard that they were trying to, 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 to create a kind of pilot for a mobile payment, they were, uh, the, the first idea that was to uh, move the, 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 the currency to the mobile system. So then we thought that would be a really interesting case for us to study because uh, if they do a lot of other things that they already do and they, they have this capacity to spread out uh, uh, this model all over the country to other poor neighborhoods in, in, in different parts of, of Brazil. So they, if they, this thing went well, so I think we, we could see this the, finally the, the, the mobile payment taking off in, in Brazil. Uh, and then we, we that, that's where our project started. So when we first learned about this idea, then we decided to, to investigate this case but that, because we thought this case has a potential to, to uh, disseminate the idea of mobile payment in Brazil. Okay, so 
first uh, uh, six months of the research, so we focused on, more on the qualitative part uh, of our work, so, and then we made a lot of interviews with different actors, all the actors involved, uh, Banco Palmas, all the executives uh, 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 involved in all the other organizations involved in that, so, uh, and, and, and some of the clients but, uh, and merchants, so a central bank and the Ministry of, of uh, Social Development. So then we went all to, uh, to this, those guys and trying to find out how this model was created and how it was established. Okay, then we learned uh, that, 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 that this whole story can be divided in, in, uh, in two uh, states. First stage was in 2011 so when the Ministry of Social Development, we heard yesterday a lot about CCT. So uh, uh, in Brazil, uh, Bolsa Familia is, the, is the, our CCT case, so uh, our cash con uh, conditional cash transfer model there. So it's, it serves about around 13 million families uh, in the country. Uh, if you count more or less four people per family, so you see that it's Oh, it's a, almost 40 percent of the population of the country somehow is uh, served by th this program. Uh, and then the Ministry of Social Development was interested, uh, and they, of course they, they, they pay the, 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 the benefit for the, 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 the poor, the poor in Brazil, and uh, they were interested in uh, make this uh, transfer through cell phone. So then they thought that that could be a good idea to give uh, the, the, the benefit, not through a plastic card, which is the way it is right now, but what if, if we make this transfer through an electronic system? So that's what the idea started. And then they make contacts with a lot of different uh, agencies, like, like uh, a, a federal bank, so Cash Economica, it's a, it's a, it's a bank, a uh, government bank which is responsible for the payment of the Bolsa Familia, and also they make contacts with all the mobile operators and all the, 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 the brands for credit cards to, to see how this could be done. So when they start uh, on this conversation, so then came the central bank and said, oh, oh, come on, let's talk better about this case. So, and then the central bank said, no, 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 better than this right now, so you, you need a, a stronger regulation for doing that, so that's not the right time, so we're gonna work on this regulation, so let's wait a bit for that. So, this is, was in 2011, and in 2012, the beginning of this year, nothing related to that, but because of that first story, started a second story. So then uh, Caixa Econômica decided, oh, that could be a good that thing to do. So Caixa is responsible for paying the Bolsa Familia. And they were thinking on make some kind of experiment on mobile payment when, with, with the poor. But they, uh, not necessarily related to Bolsa Familia, but to the poor clients that they, they have. So then they called a team of uh, uh, a company. So, uh, Vivo is a mobile operator, MasterCard, and Redcard, which is a, the, the acquirer that works all, all together, and all of them joined Caixa, who had a partnership with Banco Palmas. And with, through this, this partnership, they thought, oh, we, can, we could reach the poor. So, because they, 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 all the things that we've been uh, listening here, so about trust, about uh, how to convince people to use. So this partnership with Banco Palmas would be very useful and interesting for them to promote uh, the, 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 the mobile payment in, in this particular neighborhood. And of course, they also need to make this partnership with the merchants of uh, the neighborhood. So then started the second uh, part of the story that we're actually investigating this case. Okay. So what's going on, uh, in fact, there? So uh, we talked to, 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 to people there and then and, and everybody, to, to all, the, all the, the, the players, and we found out that they registered uh, 1,400 uh, people to use the system uh, because they give them free chip, so they need to open an account at Kasha there, 
So you see there are those, those uh, girls there, they, they sell, they, 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 they convince people that go to, this is inside Banco Palmas. So when a, a client goes to Banco Palmas to, to do whatever thing, so they approach to the client and say, oh, you'd like to have a free chip uh, for mobile for, to use, uh, to do payments. So yeah, it's free, okay, so we're gonna get this, this chip and we're gonna use them for something. But they are not using it for, for any kind of payment, but because uh, they are, the whole thing is not uh, well connected. So, and then you see that th those uh, uh, girls that are uh, pushing the, the chips with the people, they're working for the mobile operator. So then they're actually giving them a chip that they can use as a mobile phone, a regular mobile. And usually people have already another, another operator, but then they can have two. So, and, and then also the mobile operator is um, making a big effort in this region to grow his mar its market share. So, uh, uh, and then uh, with a very aggressive uh, uh, plans, for people to make calls in a very cheap way, so then to get the, the free chip is somehow good. But you see that from those uh, 400, 1,400 uh, uh, registered people, only 500 chips are active, meaning that people that are not using that much the chip. So they, we, we went to, to some of the houses of, of the people and said, oh, wait, wait, I lost my, my chip, I don't know where I put it. I put it in a, in a, in a, in a and somewhere I don't know what it is anymore. And people actually are not using for any kind of mobile payment, they're just using for uh, making calls. And actually, if you ask them if they think that's interesting, so they, because the security uh, motivation emerges for them, because they, it's not, say, it's, I must tell you that it's not a very secure neighborhood to walk around, <laughs> including some of, you're gonna see most of our pictures are in inside places where we were not allowed to walk uh, in the, the streets with cameras and things like this because we'd be robbed if you did that. So then all those our pictures are from inside places that were were uh, allowed to do that. And then security motivation for people not to use cash is uh, 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 something that we, we discovered that it's important for them. Uh, to use the mobile payment, but even though they are not using. When you visit the, the merchants, so we see only four merchants uh, registered for, for receiving payments. Uh, as you see, we are talking from a, a, a model that's poorly B2C model. It's not P2P. The, it's completely, it's, it's, the, the whole model is not created for people to transfer more money for, uh, to other people. The model was uh, uh, set up to, for people to buy things using mobile, buy things in, 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 in stores using the mobile. This was the, the, the purpose of the model. But one thing that we, we, we think that was interesting is about the informal merchants that were not uh, formalized. So they are not kind of formal businesses. They should be treated as, uh, uh, this guy, in this case, would be peer-to-peer. But the thing is that the companies are not very well prepared to approach to those informal merchants. That would be interesting if they do, if they do that. There's a lot of informal merchants in the region. So if they had the approach for the peer-to-peer, -peer, probably they would reach better those guys. What's not happening? And uh, if you see uh, the, the, the discourse of all the players involved, you see that all of them are you know, saying different things. For example, so if you go to a mobile operator, you're gonna see them talking, the main concern for them is to gain market share. So they are involved in, in this, the, 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 uh, this pilot to try to gain more market share. That's the main goal for them. If you talk to the guys from uh, the acquirer, they see a problem of channel, of the conflict channel, because they have already POS system there. So if they replace the POS by the cell phone, so they charge 50 reais for the POS, and if they sell for the cell phone, they would charge only 12 reais. So they would lose money if they go further in this model. 
if you go to MasterCard, and then they're going to say, they, they told us, uh, oh, yeah, this is really nice, but, you know, mobile payments is going to take off only 15 years from now. So, uh, that's, and if you go to Kasha, the, the, the bank say, oh, but this is a model for, for, it's not mobile payment, but we're really interested, but we're doing some mobile banking. This is not, our focus is mobile banking. And of course, the, the, the Banco Palmas, it's a totally different kind of thing. So they are interested in, in, in social inclusion to financial inclusion. They, they, they think that they are already offering a lot of financial services, and this would be one another service that they could offer to the clients in the neighborhood, so they see more the interest of the, of the people there. So <laughs> from this, you can see that so they don't converge. So all of them are working together in the same project, but they are seeing the project as a totally different goals for each of them. Uh, of course, there are still other issues. There are some operational failures that we, we found out. For example, the process is uh, when the person uh, goes there, get interested in enrolling in the process of getting the chip, have to open an account as, at Kasha, and then have to wait 15 days to receive the credit card uh, plastic, and then they, they go there again and register the, the, the plastic, the number, the plastic on the cell phone. So then they can throw away the, the credit, the, 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 the plastic. But the thing is, some, sometimes, not sometimes, many times, we, we found out that they, uh, when they open an account at Kasha, Kasha don't send them a MasterCard card, credit card. They, they, they send them another brand. So another brand, it's not possible to do that. So they have to wait more 15 days to receive the, the MasterCard uh, uh, plastic to Resisted the, 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 to be registered in, in the system. So this is a real problem. Of course, uh, another thing that we've, we, it's clear for us talking to, with, not only with the bank, but with MasterCard and, and, and Vip, they are not used to work with a low income market. They don't have the right way to approach them. So they don't, don't actually don't know this market. They are relying on, on Banco Palmas for doing that. But the, the thing is, uh, Banco Palmas has different expectations from what they have. From that they, ha they have, so of course, and they actually uh, they don't see Banco Palmas as part of the group that take the decisions, but only part of the ones that are going to implement the decisions that were taken. So this is one thing that we we, we notice there. And from the the, the, the part the, the side of the, the the clients, we still see people even. If uh, security is an issue for them, they, it's, they, they recognize themselves as you know, very connected to, to real cash. They, I think that's interesting, the idea, but one thing, that's that the thing is not working, and uh, at the same time, so they feel like connected to the cash culture. So another thing, so uh, uh, the, the whole system was not created to uh, interoperate with other companies like other operators, other mobile operators, or other banks. It was created just to operate uh, between that group of, of, of companies, which is makes all the system very limited, and uh, it's a big problem to, to if, if you see for the, the perspective for, for uh, uh, replicability of the, the model, this, is a, this will be a problem. Okay. Uh, and what are we going to do next? So we, we promised everybody we're going to tell of them, <laughs> to all of them uh, uh, about this. It was interesting to see because it seems that they don't talk to each other. So we uh, were the ones that were telling to each other what the others were thinking. About, this, about the project that they are all together working. So in our perspective, there is a governance problem in the project. So then we're going to write a, a report and explain to them about this, our, our, our view on that. And uh, next semester, we're going to start uh, making the more quantitative uh, uh, analysis with the data. So the, the, uh, in Banco Palmas, they have very uh, rich data about the women that receive Bolsa Familia in a project called ELAS. Um, and they have lots of, they, they visit every family every, every month, and they have two years data from 5,000, no, 5,000, 
5,000 families, which is well, a rich database. So we're gonna work on this database uh, next. And uh, we also, uh, we're expecting the new regulation. Finally, the central bank is moving in a direction to create a PSP uh, uh, regulation. So the, the, the payment service provider regulation. Uh, we expect that as th this re new regulation came up, so a lot of this kind of thing will, will change. So because uh, at least that's the intention that at the central bank to push in the direction of the implementation of mobile payment and this uh, new regulation will do that. And we are also organizing in, in, in April, beginning of April, a seminar in, in our school to discuss this with all those, those partners. I think that that would be interesting. And of course, so the Ministry of Social Development is also waiting for that because they're still interested in, in making the, 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 the payment of Bolsa Familia through cell phones. And so if they, uh, this, the moment that they start doing that, they will become the biggest client of mobile <laughs> operators in Brazil. So in one like this, it will be 13 million clients getting into the system of mobile payment if they start uh, 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 doing that. And of course, uh, Banco Palmas is still also moving. It's going to be their 15th anniversary uh, next January. So we're gonna go, we're gonna be there and, and explain, tell them all the results of our, our, our research. And well, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's been a wonderful presentation, set of presentations. I would like to invite the audience to, uh, you know, uh, ask questions and clarifications and so on. What we'll do is we'll take all the questions and then they'll um, respond to it uh, one at a time. So now it's for the audience to ask any questions. Hi, um, I'm Ashita from the School of Information at UC Berkeley. My question is to Judith. Um, when you're talking about the regulation of financial systems, I was wondering who exactly was regulating them, the, the central bank or the, the telecom regulation? Let's go to the next question, please. Hi, Gustav Peebles from the New School. Um, so I was fascinated to hear that the central bank in Brazil uh, was not interested in initially promoting mobile payments, but seemed to be completely uninvolved in the proliferation of social currencies. Um, you know, because usually central banks are, get kind of nervous around the idea of the issuing of social currencies, and and the, and the reason they one reason they do is because they get worried about their ability to sort of measure and control the money supply. And so I just sort of thought that that really interestingly raised questions about sort of macro level questions for us about um, to what extent, you know, with mobile money moving into the field of loans and credit and debt, to what extent, um, you know, central banks need to start worrying about that uh, in different ways than we've been paying attention to. Okay, we'll take one more question in the front. There's a, some, some in the front. Please bring the mic. Anybody in the front? <clears throat> this is addressed to the second presenter. Uh, could you just throw a little more light on the statement which said, access to IC ICT services, household savings and repayment capacity are not correlated to richness or poorness of the region. Thank you. Okay. All right, let's have the uh, speakers to respond to those questions. Yeah. It's very short. It's not the central bank. It's the uh, uh, Comisión Nacional Bancaria y de Valores. That uh, is a commission that regulates and, in, in general, gives the rules and regulations. Are you answering the first question? Sorry? Yes, I'm just no. answering the, the, first the, question. that specific question. It's like the security exchange market mm. uh, regula regulatory. Thank you. So I can tell a, a, a bit about this, the, the history in Central Bank uh, in Brazil. Well, the thing is, uh, they, their uh, concern in the beginning, uh, and, and the, 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 when the Ministry of Social Development 
first thought about delivering the, the, the Bolsa Familia to the cell phone, uh, they thought that they, the, the way they were designing the process would be that they would create silos uh, and with you know, different companies, they are not creating some kind of uh, universal uh, ecosystem for exchanging. So that's, that's at least their explanation for why they, they, they told uh, uh, the ministry to, to wait a little bit for the, the new regulation. But w what we, we see now that they are very uh, uh, you know, uh, affirmative, uh, positive in terms of creating this environment. So this new regulation that is about to, 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 to come up probably the beginning of next year uh, on, on the payment service provider, uh, it, it's interesting and can change a bit of everything. But uh, it, it won't be uh, until savings and other kind of services. It's, it's more like a, a, to create a, a, a payment environment. Now, uh, it, uh, actually, the idea is to uh, uh, not to take off the, the, co the control, uh, because now banks have the total control of, of the payment systems in the, in the country. So with this new regulation, banks will have less control on that. So new players can, can come up with this, this uh, and they take part of the system. But it's only payment. It's not related to savings or any other kind of services. Third question. Um, with regards to the access to ICT services, household savings and repayment capacity um, being not correlated to the richness and uh, poorness of the area, um, we have seen uh, through the research that um, Cebu being the more advanced which is um, technically the richer area compared to Serangani, um, it seems that the access to the IT ser services is really more dependent on um, having to promote the ICT, the agricultural IT services within those areas and um, the um, connectivity of, of uh, the mobile ser service providers rather than um, them being rich or poor. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Right there. Okay, sure. Yes, um, thank you, nice presentations. Um, my question is directed to um, the ICT and farming. I, I was just wondering uh, if your study also look at the, the value chain of farming, uh, looking at the production side, the, the transportation, and then the marketing. At what stage is ICT more important in this uh, direction? And also whether ICT has any productivity effect in terms of crop yielding that will help farmers to save more and uh, other things. Uh, thank you. Okay. Yeah, please. Yes, um, we are actually looking at that. Um, it's just that when um, the data that we tried to generate um, in time for this mid project presentation um, was not um, complete, complete, so I'm, I'm unable to present um, part of that um, research. Any other? Yeah, this. Thank you very much. My name is Tim Waima from University of Nairobi in Kenya. Uh, very interesting presentations. Uh, but my question is to Eduardo. A very interesting presentation. I don't know what will ever happen. Um, you were describing uh, mobile money adoption in northeastern Brazil. And I don't know whether the pilot that you were studying whether it's happening in a particular state in northeastern Brazil, what are the other states doing? Is this the first pilot in the whole Brazil, or do other states do other states have their own pilots? And uh, I'm just wondering and curious whether the Brazilian government has talked to other countries in the region to find out how they are doing their mobile money adoption, because it looks like uh, with with the interests that everybody is pursuing. Uh, it will be very difficult to move forward. 
Uh, the, the thing is, uh, mobile mobile money hasn't take off, taken off in Brazil yet. Uh, we, but we have have some experience, including Judith has studied one of, of, of our cases, which is uh, pago. But it's not focused to the, the, the poor. And it was more like a, a model uh, based on, uh, it was a kind of credit card in, in your cell phone. It's B2C uh, related model, it's not P2P. And uh, this, this case, probably Adrian knows better the numbers, but it's some few thousand people using this, is that right? 15,000. 15, There's 15, only 15,000 uh, in the whole country uh, using uh, this, meaning almost nothing. Yeah, so, uh, and then, but this is the first case uh, in terms of uh, this specifically designed to the poor. That's the, the difference of this case. Uh, and I'm telling you about the, what, the, in terms of the other countries. So Brazil, it's an interesting space for experiments in, in terms of that. And other countries, of course, are looking to it. But the other countries are so different. Probably Judith know better than I uh, in terms of how much how different are between the countries. So, but I, I really believe that we, we, if we do something uh, that works well, and in my opinion, uh, this strategy in Brazil to use the Bolsa Familia as a way to launch uh, mobile payment would be a uh, no, very no, interesting strategy because very soon we could reach millions of people. So if you reach millions, then we're going to have the externality that it is needed to make the mobile payment to take off. Thank you. There's a question there. Sorry, please go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Just to add that in Latin America, the, the mobile banking model has really not been launched and adopted uh, in a large scale. Um, but what is happening is exactly what, what Eduardo was mentioning. In Brazil, it's through the Bolsa de Familia. Um, in Peru, it's through Amigos. In Mexico, it's through Oportunidades that are the cash conditional transfer programs where the government is using the mobile to send the resources. But the problem is that, um, well, maybe in Brazil, I don't know what the numbers are. In Mexico, uh, right now, there are only like 10,000, not more than 15,000 uh, benefic beneficiaries from the conditional cash transfer uh, programs. So that's one way to go, but it, I don't think we'll guarantee the results. Thank you very much. Next question, the back. Somebody raise a hand. You. Yes, my name is Lotta Björklund Larsson, Linköping University from Sweden. Thank you so much. It's very interesting, and I learn a lot by listening to you. But in the back of my mind is always this question, and it's not really what you know what you question as such with your research. But do you have? And I want to challenge you a little bit about this. Do you see any really impact of getting the poor out of their dire, you know, dire life with these type of impact of uh, what you have been studying? If there's, you know, numbers or specific examples or so forth. So what I, what I see clearly uh, changing the, the the landscape of the poor. In, in, in Brazil, it's the the the, the CCT uh, model. So the Bolsa Familia is really changing. So we have done, have been done studies on that all over the country. We've seen so how important is this 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 transfer cash transfer programs has changed the way people live in poor in poor areas of the country. So it's it's improving in, in many different ways. Uh, you can. Tell, for example, the way it, it's creating jobs inside small cities that was there were nothing there. So because they have to, they start buying things in the, the community. Uh, but it's also related not to mobile, but related to the correspondent banking. That most of the, the um, around 70 percent of the, the cash transfer programs are withdrawn are withdrawn in, in uh, correspondent bankings, the correspondent banking network. So, and then in this case, you see really changing. What we see, 
from this, and especially, specifically the, the, the people from the Ministry of Social Development also see, is that they, if they do that through the cell phone, they not, cannot also uh, deliver the cash to the cell phone, but they also can keep uh, in touch with people all the time. So they would improve the, the, the quality of the information that they have from the people uh, through the, the, the same system. So what we, we see from this, the possibility for this, is that we can move to the, another level. So if the, in the first level, so you see change, the, the situation changing because of the cash transfer programs, so you're gonna see this system improving using the cell phone. So this is my, my, my point of view. I, I would just like to add that I think that the um, potential for transforming the life of the poor is not mobile banking. M mobile banking is, is just a tool, as, as, as we were talking about with Jonathan this morning. Um, what really has an impact is the mechanism through which it has an impact, or one of the most significant mechanisms, is through savings. It, that, that is just amazing, and, and I've seen it, and in the case of Latin America, there is a, a group called Proyecto Capital that I could, that we know about, because we were there, and we were witness to, to the impact of financial inclusion in the lives of women, of a very, you know, of the lowest um, income level. And, and yes, it does have a potential of transforming the lives of the poor, but it's really through the financial inclusion, and mobile just makes it easier for that to happen, it, you know, as, as it usually does diminish transaction costs. And, and Let's say another thing. So the, the Projeto Alice that we're gonna study next, we just got the data, it's very, uh, the idea is very close to the one that we saw in Peru, the Projeto Capital. So it's not only to give money to the people, but to teach them how to use. So I show you the one, one of the pictures uh, of the, the, the session of uh, financial education. So so that's what Banco Palmas does. All, all the, the the community banks that I show, that I told you, they do more or less the same. They are not are only interested on the, the money that's itself, the, the the cash transfer itself, but to to create the the, uh, the whole. Uh, conscious of, of uh, consciousness of, about how to use the finance to improve their lives. Any response from the speaker from Philippines? Do you want to add to this? Um, for the agricultural technical service um, services to be available through the mobile phone, definitely it's just a, a tool. Um, the impact that we're looking at is towards the long term that um, these farmers would be able to be more productive in um, in in their produce. Um, having the access to market information, ready, readily uh, accessible market information that probably we won't be seeing that um, fast. I mean, it, it can be take years for, for Philippines to reach that level, um, but we see several um, initiatives being done to get to that point. So hopefully in the near future, it, it would happen. Thank you. One last question, anybody? I just want to add something here. We're doing some work in the small business communities in Southern California. These uh, presentations are so, so uh, really very important for me, for our group. Uh, there are, uh, there's one point which we are addressing. We have, don't have answers. I want uh, us to think about it. The uh, technology is, uh, while it's bringing the benefits to the communities, it's also affecting their uh, ecologies uh, very seriously, small businesses, uh, their social and uh, you know, very community functions. So something to think about, is technology uh, a benefactor? Um, I mean, if say in what ways, uh, what, are they, what happens to the community lives if the uh, technology comes into these small businesses because they've got all, all kinds of personal relationships, uh, community relationships, that's what we are studying. And these presentations are very, very useful for, for, uh, for somebody like me. Thank you very much, I appreciate it. And let's have some nice lunch.